Welcome back. In the uh, last video, we talked about the ideology and the political ideas and identity of the Republican Party. Um, and what is called new conservatism, Reaganomics, and the, the economic ideas and the, what's called, you know, you know, socially conservative and what they believe. So the groups that definitely support the Republican Party are obviously socially conservatives and people that believe in fiscal, um, fiscal responsibility or they want to be fiscally conservative. And we want to make sure you guys are clear on the elite, very, very wealthy people tend to be Republican. Uh, if they don't, the less taxes, they feel that they're, you know, obviously they, they think that their success is due to their own individual actions um, and their wealth is earned. Therefore, they're not going to, they, they know what to do with their money better than the government. Okay. So that's one of their arguments. Upper class tend to be Republican. You can see that even St. Louis region, the more Republican areas, more conservative areas tend to be like West County where it becomes more affluent. Uh, then, you know, for example, North County, which tends to be more middle class. Big businesses tend to, to really support the Republican Party. Corporations, like an Amazon, we talked about not paying taxes. It's very male, around 70% male. Majority white. Uh, party is over 80% white. Uh, and one of the, the least biggest supporters of the Republican Party is the um, African Americans. And one of the biggest supporters of the, of the Republican Party, interest group-wise, is the National Rifle Association. Very pro-gun organizations and this uh in southern regions like in the south where guns are really really important there's churches where you bring your gun to church in that culture they tend to be much more republican fundamentalist christian we talked about is people that, be that believe that they interpret the bible literally but there's also fundamentalist muslims and fundamentalist uh, buddhists and uh, and you'll find this in all major religions however they don't necessarily vote republican but fun fundamentalist christians very conservative, and even if fundamentalist uh, religious institutions, like universities, like Liberty University is a proud fundamentalist Christian university. They tend to be much more conservative. Cuban Americans, we talked about how Cuban Americans tend to be more Republican. All right, so now let's look at the geography of the Republicans. So if you look at this map, you would think that the Republicans would win every election around, right? Well, this, this map still today is pretty consistent. The South is very Republican. That's starting to change. We're starting to see things like Georgia maybe becoming more Democrat. Um, Virginia is becoming more Democrat. Florida may actually be starting to move a little bit more on the Republican side. It was very narrowly won in the 2000 election and actually almost won by the Democrats. So Florida has been a big swing state, but actually went more Republican uh, in the last election for uh, Donald Trump over Joe Biden. Alaska's solid Republican. You can see the mountain states, very Republican. So it looks like they have a huge advantage over the Democrats. The issue is the map shows the state. And if you look at the number of representatives, the actual electoral votes they have, it's not much. Like Montana gets three votes, which is actually disproportionate. There's, there's not many people in Montana at all, but they get two senators because it's a state. And that gives them more influence in the Senate. And that's one of the issues that Democrats and other groups push back on. It really helps the Republicans. There's a lot of states that get two Republican senators a lot of times with a very small population like South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma. Very small. Nevada even has a small population. Uh, New Mexico tends to be more Democrat. We just saw Arizona shift to be Democrat for Joe Biden. And the question is, is that a trend or is that like a one-time 2020 election thing? So we're going to find out. And we talked about the Great Lake area. So rural or country areas too within a state. So in Missouri, for example, um, the Democrats really dominate St. Louis City by far. And St. Louis County is more balanced, but it's still very Democrat. It's almost over 60% Democrat. So almost two out of three people in St. Louis County are, are voting Democrat over Republican. But... There is a lot of Republican rural areas in Missouri that vote very Republican. Uh, Columbia tends to be more Democrat, and Kansas City and Kansas City suburbs tend to be much more Democrat. However, in our state, things have shifted a little bit more on the Republican side. We used to be very much a swing state, very who knew it was going to happen. Illinois, on the other side, same pattern. The rural areas of Illinois tend to be much more Republican. 
But Chicago is so vast and has so many people and is so Democrat that it basically dominates the entire state and the state is pulled Democrat uh, consistently. Wisconsin is more of a, a more of a swing state, but tends to lean more Democrat. And you can see Michigan, very Democrat because of um, unionized labor, like building cars, Ford and Chevy are up there. And Ohio is becoming more Republican, which it, it was kind of more of a swing state in the past. Pennsylvania, more Democrat, it appears. Southern states have are, are been a solid Republican block. However, Joe Biden did break through that block. We did see Georgia and Virginia go Democrat. And so did uh, Barack Obama took Virginia as well. So that's interesting. Are there more Southern states starting to move more into the Democrat? That would change things. One of the biggest talks is about Texas. Is Texas one day going to be Democrat? And there's a lot of estimates that within 20 years, because of a large Hispanic population coming into Texas, it's going to become Democrat. But you do have to remember there are Hispanic Republicans in Texas. Uh, there's rural Hispanics and Latinx people that tend to vote more Republican. They like the ideas of the Republican Party uh, about especially like Second Amendment rights and, you know, for, uh, less government. Central and mountain states, as we saw, are very Republican. And then this is really important. The Rust Belt or the Great Lakes states are swinging right now. Uh, Donald Trump tapped into this. It's starting to shift back. It's interesting to see where this is going. So we said the Rust Belt is Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, you know, and even Missouri is this idea that there was a lot of car production, a lot of manufacturing in the Midwest, and that stuff is just kind of rusting up because we don't make as many things and we don't build cars like we did in America in the past. A lot of the production of Ford and Chevys moved to Mexico where it's cheaper. Um, and a lot of those unions have, have, have starting to lose power, lost a lot of power. And Donald Trump really tapped into this anger in Pennsylvania and Ohio of this idea that... Um, you know, unions don't work anymore, and, you know, the, the Democrats want to, they want to destroy manufacturing. They don't care about manufacturing. Coal mining is a big one in Pennsylvania and Ohio as well, and they want to go to renewable energy, and that anger has kind of made the Rust Belt kind of swing, and they really feel disenfranchised, uh, and the Republicans are maybe starting to tap into that more in the Democrats. However, they started to swing back a little bit uh, with Pennsylvania going blue and helping Joe Biden win in the last election. Now, here's my questions for you I want you to think about. What Enlightenment philosopher best embodies the Democratic Party members' political ideology uh, about human nature and why? And then finally, what Enlightenment philosopher best embodies the Republican Party's members' political ide ideology about human nature and why? So who do you think uh, let's go back to the Enlightenment thinkers. Let's think of like John Locke, uh, Charles Louis Mont Montesquieu. You have, who else do we have? We have a lot. We have Thomas Hobbes. We have um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Who of the Enlightenment thinkers really embodies what they believed then? Also, I'm going to push you a little further. Who of the founding fathers, the American Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who do you think they tend, which way do they tend to lead uh, in what direction? Would they be more Republican or Democrat today? Okay, now let's look at this graph. This is a really important graph. So we talk about this, we're going to talk about this idea of political socialization. Political socialization is how we pass down our politics and our political ideology and belief through the generations, okay? So this is a really good uh, free response, something you would definitely see on a test. Let's look at this chart. So you got millennials according to the key. So first thing you are doing every arena graph is you start with the title. It says percentage identifying as politically independence by generation from 2000 to 2014, okay? So political independence means that they don't say they're Democrats or Republicans, okay? So we do a millennials from 1981 to 1998, 50% by 2014 see themselves as not Democrat or Republican. However, when you look at the next tier is the dotted line Generation X, 1965 to 1980, that's my generation, it's only about 39%. And it's actually gone down a little a bit. Like we tend to be a little bit less politically independent. We tend to be more Democrat or Republican. 
And you talk about baby boomers, 37% of them see themselves as political independent. And then finally, the silent uh, group, which is 1928 to 1945, is a straight line. They're down to 32% see themselves as independent. So you can see millennials, and if we had to make a prediction, Generation X or your generation, um, Y and Zs, you guys might even be more politically independent. Like, you might not even want to be a Democrat at all if we had to, based on this graph and based on this data. So let's look here. So what are some questions they have? Identify the percentage of baby boomers who identify as independent. So the baby boomers um, see themselves in 2014, according to this, with the, the broken line, as 37%. And that is up. They were at only 31% saw themselves as independent. So if you had 100 people that were born from 1946 to 1964, and you said, are you politically independent? Uh, originally, it was only, only about 3 out of 10 people would say, yeah, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. However, that's increasing. Describe the trend of the data. Well, if we're looking at this for patterns, and I want you to think about that one. So some of the things I hope you guys recognize about the trend in the data is that the data is moving um, in a direction where all groups except for uh, Generation X are actually becoming more politically independent. So if we had to look at numbers today, it would be safe to say that people are starting stopping to see themselves as Democrats and Republicans, and they don't see themselves as party members as much as they did uh, in 2000, which is interesting. And, and millennials are really moving away from the Democrats and Republicans, which is interesting. 50%, half of people that are millennial say, I'm not either or. And the other half says, no, I'm a Democrat or Republican. Now, let's look at this. Explain how the trend might affect political campaigns in the future. I want you guys to think about that one. Okay, so it ex some of the trends you might see in the future is that maybe if we're thinking on the Democratic side and the party's shrinking, then they have to work harder and, they're to, and the Republicans too to kind of reach out to these independents. They have to really attract people that don't see themselves as Democrats or Republicans, don't like them. So I'm not sure that campaigns, campaigning advertisements the best move. Wouldn't analytics make more sense, like using Facebook and Twitter to get ideas out there? So I'm a Republican, wouldn't I want to push arguments about guns or push information propaganda that really supports ideas of guns and that again a big one right now is freedom of speech is like is hate speech a freedom of speech issue and the, if you're a republican you say yeah yeah it's it's very important that kind of speech you might push that those ideas and then your politics and your economics but you don't want to necessarily package it i would think as oh this is a republican campaign commercial because people get turned off to that because there's less and less people, especially millennials, that will even look at that. Another thing, explain how political parties should adapt based on the data shown in the, the graph. And that's where I'd kind of wrap that in, too. Where, what do you do with this? If the parties are going to evolve, are the parties breaking down? Are they breaking apart? Are we going to have more parties now? Are people moving to other parties? Well, according to this, there's actually less people that even see themselves in any kind of party. So that's, a, that's an issue. The other issue is uh, arguing things that based on being a Democrat or Republican, that's kind of losing a lot of merit. So maybe people that could reach across the aisle like a Joe Biden are becoming more attractive. On the other side of it, though, uh, Donald Trump did a really good job of using analytics and he bought Cambridge Analytics and he used a lot of um, propaganda to really push people to vote for him that weren't necessarily Republicans. And it worked. So are people becoming more aware of this, though, too, is the other issue. Are people becoming aware that the parties are using other means than just hitting you with a bunch of Democrat and Republican signs in people's front yards and hitting you with more uh, analytics and misinformation online that makes things divisive that weren't even divisive? Because when I think about like a vaccine, there's really nothing polarizing about a vaccination. I don't see why that would be on a education wise why would that be a democratic or republican issue i mean there's republican doctors that took the vaccine and there's democratic doctors that took the vaccine it's a vaccine if we're all vaccinated logically speaking then we could get rid of covid and we could stop the over half million people dying that already died 
from another half million dying and then also protecting our own selves. But that became a very political issue. Is that part of the game plan that uh, Republicans have really pushed this narrative that uh, wearing masks was a big problem and it was a freedom, a freedom issue. And they use that as an example of the government trying to control us by pushing us to wear masks in a pandemic. I don't know that that would have been such a polarizing issue 20 years ago, like 9-11 was a pretty unifying issue. However, things have changed. Uh, and you do have people like Alex Jones, more conspiracy theorists that tend to um, push these narratives. And Alex Jones was famous for pushing the, the story that somehow the Pentagon and the Twin Towers was all planned by the U.S. government. We attacked ourselves. And that made him very popular. He's the number one conspiracy theorist there is now. He, and he's really pushed a lot of stories out. So I don't know. Is that the way to move people emotionally? So we got to think. Information is, I can explain things to you as a teacher and try to think, to talk to you critically. However, if I'm emotional and I'm more energetic about the way I teach, or if I present things in a very propagandic way, that might be more effective at getting you to understand it or getting you to believe what I'm saying as opposed to, let's look at the facts about vaccines. But you could die. Somebody could die from this. That's Or people are dying from this. That That's really starting to make you go, oh man, maybe I should get the vaccination. Where if I show you the numbers, you're like, eh. But that's what we need to do at school. We need to look at the logic and the numbers and the data, the holistic point of view. Now, the last part we're talking about is the Libertarian Party. And the Libertarian Party uh, in 1971, they're fiscally conservative, just like the Republicans. They believe in absolute laissez-faire. So the Republicans aren't 100% laissez-faire, obviously. They give money to companies. So these guys are completely hand-off. They, they might, a true Libertarian would say, you wouldn't even do trickle-down economics they tend to agree with the republicans much much more like libertarians tend to even join like uh Rand paul and uh uh which is the son of ron paul were both libertarians and they said that you know the republicans are too not conservative enough the government should do anything in the economy so for example in 2008 the republicans went along and supported bills that gave money to companies and to help organizations in the government uh during the recession um, however, you're a libertarian, you'd be completely against that. You wouldn't support any companies like the car companies, for example. Barack Obama and Joe Biden said, hey, we helped save Ford, uh, mostly Chevy and, and Chrysler, these car American car companies. They almost fell completely apart in 2008 with the Great Recession. And the government stepped in. The libertarian, a true libertarian would say, no, they should never step in. And you should. it's OK to have these booms and busts. They would be against things like public education. Freedom of speech above all. So we talk about hate speech. That's not on your radar if you're a libertarian. You would say, okay, people say mean things all the time or they th threaten people. That's not really the government's job to intervene. The government should do two things if you're a libertarian. Protect us with an army or they should protect us uh, protect us with police domestically and from foreign nation invasions. That's about it. They don't need to really charge much taxes for anything. And public schools, public, public schools is not a right. Healthcare is not a right. Those are all things that you earn. Those are those are things that you have to work hard for. And if your parents don't want you to go to school, so what? Or if you don't want to school, go to school, so what? Uh, and I, even most Republicans would be like saying, "Well, that's going a little too far. We still need some kind of public education for the people, even if it's not you know the way we have it now. We want charter schools or we want run like a business, but they're not going to probably go this far." So they're lazy fair on the economy. They're also lazy fair on your rights. So gun control would be non-existent if you're a libertarian, right? You maybe sign up just so we know you have a gun. That's about, and that might be going too far for a lot of libertarians. So, and it's a very new party from 1971. Uh, Gary Johnson's run for them, uh, and they've had some other candidates as well. He seems to be their most famous. It keeps rerunning. Now let's look at this final, this kind of diamond or circle. I think of. We think, of, we think of politics as very much to the left or to the right. So when people say to the right, they mean conservative, okay? But if you go extremely conservative and even past libertarian, you have anarchy. There'd be no government at all. That's very conservative. And then on the left, if you go extremely to the left, like social democrats, you go further out, you get communism, right? You have the government controls everything economically, okay? Then if you go the other ways, we talk about economic freedom and personal freedom, Left to liberals tend to be more personal freedom. That's sort of libertarians are kind of a little bit of a mix of the Democrats, much more Republican. They tend to be lazy, fair, and economics, agreeing with the Republicans. 
but they tend to be much more about personal freedom um, of our liberties like the Democrats. So we talk about protecting minority, like the government not intervening in our personal liberties and protecting things like protest and freedom of speech. That tends to be more Democrat. On the other side, you've got legislative equality, this idea that the government should legislate and try to treat people equitably, and the government's a good way of, of making the economy give everybody opportunities. And if you're a Democrat, well, we're not going to give it to you, but education, healthcare, give you the opportunities to be happy and healthy and be what you want. If you're not going to work hard at school and earn your grades, in the end, you're not going to get it, okay? But on the other side, they say, well, you can't let, we need to legislate what's right or wrong. If you're Republicans, they tend to legislate like the Nazis, uh, which, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, but they move more towards the Nazi and the Soviet approach that, okay, the government needs to say what's right or wrong. And it's wrong, like abortion, for example, that would be something that we have to legislate. The government says, you know, we are Christian, Judeo-Christian society, abortion's wrong, therefore let's make it illegal. Where Democrats say, no, 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 that's a personal freedom issue, and the government should legislate. So that kind of gives you this where things are. And it's much more complicated than this, but this gives you kind of an idea of how far things could go left and right, and they can go other ways. Authoritarian versus more libertarian. So authoritarianism, you can see that the right and the Republicans content are, might be moving more th towards authoritarianism with Donald Trump. It's kind of like the leader of the party. Or the Democrats, not so much. Joe Biden's the president, but he's not like the defi He's the leader of the party because he's the president. But he's also, I wouldn't say he's, it's not that he's already getting criticism from especially social Democrats or more